So what we need to tease out this, uh, this relationship, what we need to show that there is indeed a difference, is to exploit, uh, is to find a way where the relative income of women and men changed without any other change concomitant to that. And I've done some work on the old age pension program in South Africa, which sort of satisfies this property. Uh, the benefits for blacks under the old age pension program grew very rapidly between 1990 and 1993 at the end of the apartheid. It's a huge social program, which is means tested and non contributory 85% of African family qualify for it. And a lot of children live with a, with a grandmother or grandfather, so about one third of black children live with a pension recipient. And what I found in the data is that if you look at girls, young girls who live with a grandmother grow faster, they are taller, and they're also a little bit chubbier, uh, compared to those who live with either no grandparents or with a, a grandfather. So there's no impact of having a grandfather getting a pension, but there is a very strong positive effect of uh, having a grandmother getting a pension. And this effect is large. Showing, living with a grandmother who gets a pension is enough to bridge half the gap in stage and height between uh, girls and, and boys. A bit, sorry, between US girls and uh, Af South African girls. So other than giving income to women, there are other pathways to women empowerment which uh, changes the relative position of, uh, of women and men. Uh, the resources that women can control matter, so for example, another paper that Duncan Thomas and others showed that uh, in Indonesia, you, the resources you bring to the household stay with you in case of separation. And they showed that women who came with more resources in the household have more bargaining power and invest more in girls. The divorce laws matter, so what you have access, what access do you, what are your rights in case of divorce? Do you keep the children, do you keep the assets? That also affects the decision made by the household, even if they don't divorce, just because this is the horizon, this is a threat point. The marriage markets matter, so again, in case you divorce, will it be very difficult to find another husband? So the ratio of women to men in the labor market matters. And what is interesting is that you could think, well, all of that makes sense, because that makes you more powerful in a, more per in a permanent basis. So if the divorce law is favorable to you, this is something that is not changing. But a lot of the policies we consider, for, for example, conditional cash transfers, are poli a transfer that you're going to get for a little while. So the household should be able to insure each other, household members should be able to insure each other against those fluctuations. The husband should tell the wife, look, I understand you're getting this transfer for the next few years, but after that it's over. So what's the point of giving you all of the benefits now, give me what I want, and then when we stop getting the transfers, I'll compensate you somehow. But we don't see any of that. In fact, we see that uh, household members are surprisingly bad at insuring each other against even very temporary changes in income. So I have a paper with Chris Yudry from Côte d'Ivoire, which shows that uh, so women and men grow different crops. So there are years that are good for women, and they are, in terms of the rainfall pattern, is good for women. And there are years that are bad for women and better for men, depending. Because they grow different crops, the crops are differently affected by the weather. And what we find is that in a year which is good for women, more is being spent on food, more is being spent on women's clothing, more is being spent on jewelry. In a year that is bad for, for women, more is being spent on alcohol, uh, more is being spent on, 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 again, on men's clothing or private or, or, or things that are private to men. So this implies that the family is not, not only it's not a fully harmonious unit, but it's not an efficient unit. And therefore we cannot count on the family to allocate resources efficiently once we get the resources in the family. And when you think about it, this is a very serious problem because in, we, we, we let the family do a lot of work. It's in the family that education decisions are made. It's in the family that the, the decision on how to spend various transfers are made, etc. We can see that the family is a very odd unit to make all these decisions because it's not clear they're, doing, they're making them very well. So one of the dimensions in which women lag behind men is property rights. And uh, there is a lot of very good, very interesting research showing that weak property rights lead to inefficiency. So again, if the families was an efficient unit, women's property rights would not matter. 
uh, people would re reallocate optimally, uh, but the family is not necessarily efficient. And the, what we showed about the, the lack of insurance suggests that it probably isn't. So Chris Udry has a paper from Burkina Faso where he shows that women and men grow on different plots. Not only they grow different crops, but they grow on different plots. And what you see is that many more inputs go in the plot of the men. So for example, much too much fertilizer is being used on the plot of men relative to what is being used on the plot of women. Because the return to the using fertilizer are decreasing. So when you use no fertilizer, this is where the first unit of fertilizer is the most useful. So what people should do is equalize. But in fact, what you see is tons of fertilizer being used on the men's plot and no fertilizer on the women's plot. Which means that with the same quantity of fertilizer, people could reallocate resources to produce more for the family as a whole. And you see the same thing for all the other inputs, except female labor, which is used more on female plots, not surprisingly. So it suggests that just by reallocating resources within the family, household production could grow by 6% without any other things, just reallocating our inputs within the family. And one of the reasons why households are unable to do that is probably because women have very weak property rights. Because one of the reasons why women do not want husbands to, in, to work on their plot or to put fertilizer on their plot is that if you've worked a lot on the plot, it becomes yours eventually. So women feel that if they let their husband work on their plot, then eventually it will become their husband's plot and not their plot, and they certainly don't want that to happen. So this is an instance where weak property right leads to inefficiency. Another instance is another paper by Chris Yudry, who, as you might have noticed now, is a key contributor to this literature, joined with uh, Marcus Goldstein. What they show here, again, there are plots that are owned by women and plots that are owned by men. And what they show again is plots that are owned by women are less likely to be, are less productive. And the reason why they are less productive is that they are, more, they are not let fallow for long enough. So the way you re fertilize a plot in Ghana is that you, this is mainly for cassava, uh, for cassava growing. So you grow cassava for a few years, then you have to stop for a while, and you let the land rest. And then after that you can start again. But while the land is, being, is resting, someone could go and say, hey, I'm just going to take that land. You're, you, evidently you're not using it too much. So if you have very strong property rights, you can fend that off and say, no, 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 it's my land, I'm just leaving it fallow. But if you have weak poverty right, when someone comes and invades your land when it's fallow, you might lose it. The community or the village might reallocate it to this person. So in that case, you might feel like that's really not worth it. And women are less likely to want to leave their land fallow. And what they show is that this explains the entire differences between the productivity of men's plot and women's plot. There again, it's, a, it's an instance where weak property right leads to loss in efficiency. Here's another example where we shows that the, the woman power makes a difference. We have been talking about the power of women in, uh, in, in, within the household. We've been talking about property rights. And I want to talk about women as policymakers. So women and men have different policy preferences uh, related to their place in society. For example, in India, women care a lot about drinking water because they're the ones who collect drinking water and also related to these differences in preferences that we were talking about before, which is maybe women care about children more. Because when we see that their bargaining power increase, their investment in children increase. So that means that giving women the right to vote should change policy decisions in the direction of going towards what women want, because now women are more likely to be the median voter. And there is indeed one very nice paper by Grant Miller uh, which shows that when the suffrage for women was introduced in the U.S. states progressively, infant mortality dropped in those states. So in, when a state starts introducing the women's suffrage, within two years, infant mortality drops in that state relative to the other one that have done it earlier or that have not done it yet, which suggests that increasing women's, uh, giving women more political power has a direct effect. 